Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 28th of July and this quicker look quick look at the week ahead beginning the 31st of July 2023 with me Michael Hewson. Well after a, a one week break back in back in the seat and it seems to me that normal service has been resumed when it comes to equity markets. We've seen some fairly decent gains over the course of the past couple of weeks. We look at the FTSE 100, it's back above 7,700. Um, certainly starting to claw its way back slowly but surely on this daily chart that we've got here. Um, still well below the record highs that we saw um, that, that, we, that, that we saw earlier this year. But nonetheless, there does appear to be some momentum behind this current move. If we just put in a trend line, oh, wrong one, just put in a trend line here and see where the top of that line comes in. We've certainly got potential to head a little bit higher, um, rebounded quite nicely off that 7,200 area um, that I identified a couple of weeks ago um, at the beginning of July as a, as a key support area. So we've managed to to hold above that and I think the big question now is whether or not we can sustain a move higher back towards this downtrend line here because that I think for me is the next key barrier for the FTSE 100 and now we appear to have edged back towards 7,000 and above 7,700. We need to sustain that move. Um, the DAX retesting the record highs of earlier this year come to within touching distance of that uh, yesterday at around about 16,430. So that's going to be a key barrier for further gains going forward. And we've also seen a fairly decent bounce back in the CAC current, um, particularly led by the luxury sector, companies like LVMH, Hermes and what have you which have undergone quite a choppy last few days, but we do appear to be looking to head back towards 7,500. So European markets are sort of just shy of some key resistance levels. And I think really how we react around those levels will determine whether we hang on to the, these particular gains or whether we start to roll over. Everyone's talking about the risk that we could see a market crash. Again, yes, that is the narrative that's being spun by an awful lot of people. But ultimately, what it boils down to me, for me, is price action. Price action is still positive. We're still above, uh, we're still in an uptrend. We're still above the 50 day moving average. You know, and until such times as I see some significant evidence of a change of sentiment, a significant change of sentiment, then really I think the bias is likely to continue to remain towards buying the dip. Um, we saw the S&P briefly tick above 4,600 yesterday in the wake of those US second quarter GDP numbers, which were very solid, also solid set of durable goods numbers, and weekly jobless claims fell to 221,000. So, and um, continuing claims fell, fell below 1.7 million. So I think despite the fact that we've seen the Federal Reserve hike rates this week again to a 22-year high. The ECB do the same thing, hike rates to a 22-year high. Markets still remain remarkably resilient. I think what has been notable in the past two weeks is obviously UK gilt yields have fallen back from the peaks that we saw earlier this year. We're still, we're still around about 5%. Um, I think the perception still is that the Bank of England has quite a bit more to go when it comes to raising rates. But certainly, I think the more pessimistic scenarios that had the terminal rate at around about six and a half percent have been pared back somewhat and quite rightly so. I think that any anyone who thinks the Bank of England is going to want to push rates to that sorts of levels, um, you know, I, that, 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 just, that, that just that simply doesn't stand up to scrutiny. So swap rates for um, the expectations for the terminal rate have fallen back below 6%. And I think that's quite right. I think the terminal rate 
is probably at five and a half percent at the most. And we've got the Bank of England rate decision in the coming coming up in the next week or so. Um, we've also got US non-farm payrolls. We've got flash CPI for July from the EU. And we've got the RBA rate decision. And once again, the, the, the main discussion, I think, is how many more rate hikes have central banks got left in the tank? We've seen the Bank of Japan this morning tweak or not tweak its yield curve control policy. Uh, Bank of Japan Governor Kazuo Ueda has basically said that the um, ceiling for yield curve control continues to remain at 0.5%. But in the same breath, the Bank of Japan has also said that it will be buying JGBs at a yield of 1% on a daily basis. So which is it? Is it, you know, have they moved yield curve control or have they not? I certainly think that they're setting the groundwork for another policy tweak um, at their October meeting, but certainly the direction of travel does remain. Uh, see, it seems clear that the, the Bank of Japan's current policy settings aren't sustainable when core CPI is at around about 4% um, in Japan. So while the ECB, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve, you could argue that they are coming to the end of their rate hiking cycles, the Bank of Japan has barely got started. And I think that is going to be a risk going forward. That should put downward pressure on dollar yen. However, um, you can see that UADA rowing back on the policy tweak that we saw earlier this morning has seen dollar yen trade in a very wide range, 141.08, 138.06. Interestingly, um, it's held currently holding below uh, the 50-day moving average, but also the series of highs here. And I think that as long as we stay below 142 and these highs here, then dollar yen is likely to remain fairly choppy. But overall, I would still argue that um, the, the likelihood is that we will see it continue um, to trend lower over the course of the next few sessions. So I think for me, um, the bias for dollar yen remains towards the downside as long as we're able to hold below um, the series of highs through here, which is around about 142.20. Retest um, the bottom end of this Ichimoku cloud channel, head back towards the 200 day moving average, which managed to act as support um, for the dollar um, earlier this month back in July. So, um, you know, the bigger question I think that needs to be answered with respect to this week is, was was the rate hike that we saw this week from the Federal Reserve the last one? Well, we now focus on the Jackson Hole annual symposium at the end of August, and the next meeting, the next Fed meeting, is in September. We have two payrolls reports in the time um, between now and the next Fed meeting. We also have two CPI reports. CPI is um, has fallen back once again. It's slowed down quite significantly, and core price is also slowed at the last at, 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 at the June at the June at the June reading. So um, I think the bias is for a pause from here on in. Similarly for the ECB, GDP numbers are showing that um, the economy is struggling in Europe, particularly Germany, which I just saw a manufacturing PMI. Uh, coming at 38, which is, you know, it's just so poor, it's not funny. And that would suggest that the German economy could well contract in Q3, as well as uh, following on from the contractions in Q1 and Q2. So I think it's unlikely that the, the ECB will want to put even further upward pressure on rates at a time when inflation is slowing, but growth is also slowing. And that's why we've seen euro dollar slow in the way or fall quite sharply in the way that it did yesterday in the wake of those comments from Christine Lagarde when she said that there was a possibility that um, all the heavy lifting had been done on rates and uh, potentially that could mean that yesterday's rate hike could well have been the last. But again, they, again, central banks have insisted they're data dependent, but overall I think the risk now is not so much pricing in 
rate cuts because I don't think they're likely at this point in time. It's really a question now of how long do rates stay at the levels that they currently are. And I don't think that is something that markets have fully got their heads around. I think over the last 15 years, markets have got used to lower rates and an expectation that as soon as things get difficult, central banks cut rates quickly. I think that particular mindset is mistaken. I think rates are likely to remain high for probably longer than most people think, and that rate cuts are likely to come much more slowly. And I don't think that's something that markets have fully factored in. Rates are likely to remain more normalized now than has been the case for quite some time. So let's look at euro dollar. We're looking at it at the moment. Let's quickly draw a quick line through here, see where we are with respect to this particular trend line. Um, not much to see there, but certainly I think the bias does remain for a move back to the 50 day moving average, this series of lows down here at around about 108.50. That's, that's the next key support level on euro dollar. But certainly the bias does appear to suggest that US rates are likely to remain higher for longer given the relative resilience of the US economy relative to the European economy. That's why European, that's why the euro is falling. Um, the markets are pricing in a much slower rate of fall for US rates, given the fact that the jobs market still remains fairly tight. And um, we've got payrolls on Friday, the 4th of August. Um, and, and again here, um, the July report is not going to be particular. I don't think it's going to be particularly um, noteworthy. Uh, I certainly don't think that we're going to see a significant amount of weakness in the jobs report next week. I certainly think it's unlikely. Uh, I think we're unlikely to see the type of ADP jobs report that we saw in June when we saw 497,000 jobs added to the US economy, we could well see a little bit of a tempered reaction for the July one. Markets are pricing in 185,000 jobs for July for the ADP, um, but they're also um, pricing in 190,000 jobs for non-farm payrolls, and we saw 209 in the June numbers. Unemployment is at 3.6%. Um, average hourly earnings year on year was revised up to 4.4. So certainly those sorts of numbers um, certainly don't lend lend myself to think that the Fed will be hiking again, but they certainly don't think I don't certainly don't think they'll be lending to the idea they'll be cutting either. So we are where we are with respect to the Fed, and I think we've probably hit peak Fed. We'll just have to wait and see what the numbers tell us um, going forward. But that should mean that the dollar will probably main, remain slightly more resilient than say for example the euro against the pound i'm more on the fence i'm on the fence on this basis this chart here we're still very much in the uptrend that we've been in since early march um, decent support in and around 127 and a half the bank of england is set to raise rates this coming week by another 25 basis points at the very least um, we might see 50 i'm dubious as to whether we will. Um, we did see inflation slow slightly more than expected in June to 7.9%. Um, and it could be argued that the pressure to, for the Bank of England to hike by 50 has eased somewhat. Core CPI also slowed more than expected to 6.9%. So again, that's good news, but it's still eye-wateringly high. Um, and you know, it does mean that obviously expectations, market expectations of where the terminal rate is likely to be have slipped from 6.5% to below 6. So I think with inflation for July expected to slow even more markedly as the effects of the energy price cap get adjusted lower over time, there is an argument to suggest we might be close to the end of the cycle for the Bank of England. So we could see 25 next week, but we could see a hawkish 25. So given the fact that we've got the CPI numbers out on the 18th of August, there or thereabouts, the, the MPC could say, 
We're going to hike by 25. We're going to shadow the ECB and the Federal Reserve. But unless we see much more progress, tangible progress on inflation, we're going to go again um, in the meeting afterwards. And I think that will probably be the sensible thing to do. Go by a hawkish 25. So that um, essentially, essentially you're being cautious about the effects and the pass-through effects of past rate hikes, which probably haven't hit the UK economy quite yet. This will also be the first meeting for new MPC member Megan Green. Um, she replaces Silvana Tenrero, um, who is one of the more dovish members of the MPC and who voted to keep rates on hold, along with Swati Dingra um, at the last meeting. I would expect another split decision um, in the meeting this week, but I would expect, but I am expecting to see a hawkish 25 basis points. I think that would be more effective than a dovish 50. So we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Certainly Bank of England decision going to be a key um, staging post for how the pound performs over the course of the next few sessions. We've also got the RBA um, next week. Going to probably skip over that to a certain extent. We've seen a little bit of a sell-off in the Aussie dollar over the course of the past few days. And I think there is an expectation given um, some of the softening in Australian CPI that the RBA could well be done as well. Um, another 25 basis points later this week, we saw Q2 CPI um, suggest that the heavy lifting has been done when it comes to inflation. Even though on an annual basis, inflation is much higher and trending lower, it is proving to be sticky. Uh, it slipped back to 5.4% from 5.5% in the June numbers, but unemployment again still low at 3.5%. They might be tempted to nudge rates a little bit higher from 4.1 to 4.35. Um, they could they could do a dovish hold, you know, or, or a dovish hike even, um, or a hawkish hold. We'll have to wait and see. But certainly the key support on the Aussie is around about 66, but we've also got trend line support here. And I think that consolidation will continue. So I think it's 50-50 as to what the RBA will do this coming week. Um, but whether they do put 25 or whether they hold, it's probably neither here nor there. Um, in terms of earnings, it's been a busy week this week. We've seen um, Shell post some underwhelming set of numbers, um, largely on the back of lower oil prices, lower natural gas prices, higher margins. That would suggest that this week's BP numbers are likely to be similarly uh, along similar lines. Certainly, we are seeing evidence that the progress that we're seeing or the uptrend that we've been seeing when it comes to oil and gas is starting to run out of steam. Maybe I need to redraw that line a bit there. So let's go and do that. Through that low there and through that low there. Uh, we've, got that, we've got that nice little trend line from the lows back in August last year which we are looking we could well test over the course of the next few days unless we see um, further upticks in the prices of oil and gas we've seen some fairly decent um, progress in the price of oil over the last um, two to three weeks certainly near 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 the highest levels that they've been for over a month now um, but that hasn't really given much of an impetus in terms of the bp um, share price which is starting or does appear to be showing signs of finding a little bit of a top draw a line through that there got a nice little trend line there we've also got the, the the moving averages starting to roll over on the 100 and the 200 day so that is not a uh, death cross by the way um if anyone is asking because the 200 is still pointing upwards then that but they both need to be pointing down and then not um so that's bp next week probably going to be a similar trend to the shell ones this week this week we saw rolls royce um, up their guidance for this year um, they will be reporting their second quarter numbers on the 3rd of august um, earlier this week it's rolls royce revealed that it was trading ahead of expectations it upgraded its full year guidance um, un raising its full year underlying profits to between 800 million um, from 800 million and 1 billion pounds to between 1.2 and 1.4 billion, also raising its cash 
um, the free cash flow forecasts. The key thing for me will be large engine flying hours. At the end of Q1, they were currently at 65% of 2019 levels. And while they're not likely to go back to those 100% um, of those levels, Rolls-Royce is targeting a return to around about 85, 90% of those levels over the course of the coming year. The announcement has pushed the Rolls-Royce share price back to the levels it was just before the COVID lockdowns, all the way back in March 2020. So it does appear to have found its level. And I think now that we've seen the low hanging fruit picked off, any further progress is likely to depend on how the rest of the business performs, defense, power systems and what have you, and small modular reactors. But we are heading in the right direction. And that is positive if you're a Rolls-Royce shareholder. Um, we've also got Apple's numbers coming out, third quarter numbers. Um, one of the few standouts, I think, Apple has been. $3 trillion company has seen a little bit of a has seen a little bit of a top out just below $200, $195, $193 at the moment. So it's just about hanging on to that $3, $3 trillion market cap level. Um, to this week's Q3 numbers are likely to be key in the context of whether or not we can continue the progress that we've seen since the start of the year. If I put year to date on there, we can see how well Apple has performed relative to its peers, seen some fairly decent gains, and it's up by 48%, nearly 49% year to date based on, as you can see that there in the, uh, in the, uh, in the value box there, change up $63, 48.71%. So that's a neat little feature there telling you how much progress um, that particular uh, share has made. So I think the big question I think will be how well is iPhone demand holding up? It has its new, has its new savings account continued to attract um, uh, track savers, currently has a savings account rate of 4.15%. Don't know whether or not they've actually adjusted that higher in light of the recent Fed rate hike. Certainly in the last quarter, they saw inflows of almost $1 billion in the first three day, first few days of launching with 240,000 accounts signing up to the service. Although you do need to have an Apple credit card to qualify for an Apple savings account. What was also particularly notable in the last set of numbers was on a regional basis, the rest of Asia Pacific was a notable outperformer, seeing revenues of $8.12 billion, which was an 18.55% beat on forecasts, as well as a big jump from last year with India driving a lot of those gains. The Americas were the one area of disappointment in their Q2 numbers with revenues of $37.78 billion, which was a big drop from last year's $40.89 billion, a more than 7% decline. So, you know, can, can Apple prevent itself from seeing a, another revenue decline quarter on quarter? In Q2, um, it was the second quarter in succession that Apple had been unable to grow its revenues. And that was the first time this has happened since 2016. But the four to three percent was below the five percent Apple had predicted when they reported in Q1. So, you know, can can Apple stave off another quarterly fall in earnings growth? So that's pretty much it, I think, for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, thank you very much for listening. Hope you all have a great week, great weekend. Don't forget to join me next week for the non-farm payrolls webinar. It starts just after one o'clock, um, goes over the numbers and finishes at around about um, quarter to two. So that's it. Thanks very much for listening. It's Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets.